Hi, this is Les Posting, Clinical Psychologist, Flightwise, Fear of Flying Programs, Melbourne, Australia. Welcome. It's uh, mid-April, just before Easter or Passover. Lots of people will be, will be taking lots of flights there and back. I've, in fact, just bought, I think, five flights to Melbourne, out, outward bound to Cairns, to the Gold Coast, to Darwin, because a certain airline that I fly with had some specials on really cheap. And so I just grabbed them. I just took up for a day or just a night just to get out of Melbourne in the dead of winter, which in Melbourne is July, August is our coldest times. And so we're going to go up north. But I want to talk to you today about a particular problem that uh, bugs a lot of people who come to see me. It's one of the questions that almost always gets asked when uh, or pointed out when people ring me to say, well, are you the sort of person that can help me? And the question is, how come the more often I fly, the worse I'm getting. This really bugs a lot of people. It annoys some people and it terrifies others. The reason being, is there something really wrong with me? Because all through my life, I've learned by both experience and being told and read that the more often you do something, the better you get at it. So how is it that the more often I fly, the worse I'm getting? This seems to fly in the face of most people's sort of non-scholarly understanding of how learning happens in human beings. Let me bring you some of the scholarly applications to get that out of the way because you kind of learn this in Psych 101 and then into your postgraduate training. I want to speak just for a moment about four types of learning that we do. Four types. I speak about this in the work that I do with my patients. First one, it's called instrumental learning where you are the instruments of learning. The classic one as a child, even before language forms, you touch something that's hot, ouch! And you learn, don't do that again. You eat something, mmm, tasty, I'm going to do more of that. And so instrumental learning is where, basically through trial and error, you learn what's good for you, what's not good for you. The more likely you get pleasure from it, the more likely you are to do that behavior again in certain circumstances. The less pleasurable it is, the more painful it is, the less likely you are in the same circumstances to do that again. Okay, so that's instrumental learning. Next type, vicarious learning. Some, some people call it vicarious learning. Basically, you watch what happens to other people and without having to have that experience yourself, you see what happens to them in terms of reward or punishment or neutral, and you can take on board, well, I think I'll give that a try since something pleasant happened to the person I watched, or that doesn't look like such a great thing to do. I think I might avoid doing that. It's why in, uh, in law, if you go to trial and you don't experience remorse, you're more likely to get a, a stronger punishment so the rest of the public learns that it's important that you experience or express at least public remorse if you've committed a criminal act. You'll get a high penalty if you don't. So vicarious learning is meant to be around. It's part of who we are, where we learn from the experience of others what to do or what not to do. We think that most other animals don't learn that way, but the higher up you go in the chain, uh, the more likely you are to see other animals um, kind of do things that we human watch what happen, another, happens to another animal and learn from that experience but we human beings have taken this to a very unique level or a unique level third form of learning is what i call learning by authority or guardianship you're a young person you're told we don't do things like this around here this is how we do things and then that tends to translate into adult life when you go to work and you look and say well how can we we're doing this well that's why we've always done it around here don't rock the boat, just put your head down and just do it the way we want to do it. Even though if you may have come from another industry or with some new learning from your latest uh, training, you might think that's a bit, you know, skew if why are we doing it this way? Well, that's how we do things around here. Just don't rock the boat. So that's learning by uh, authority. Not much learning, in fact, at all, except just keep your head down. Fourth bit of learning, and this is really quite important in the work, is what we call evolutionary primed learning, sometimes referred to as the experience of a super fear. This is where seemingly nature, evolution, however you want to call it, has given those with a certain predilection for behaving a certain way an advantage called survival over those that don't do it that way. 
because over the course of a number of generations, doing certain behaviors will see you perish. That is, you're somebody else's lunch. So the ones we often refer to are very loud noises. We hear a loud noise and you do this automatically. There's a screech of brakes outside. You cringe, even though you might be quite perfectly safe inside, mainly because very loud noises, except for 150 years ago, were made by nature. We've only been making loud noises as human beings for the last 150 years or so. But before then, any loud noise was surely a sign of danger. Earthquakes, volcanoes, marauding animals in the jungles, warring tribes sitting up the top of the, of the hill, screaming out to scare you. So loud noises were scary. Okay, So we're still hardwired for that. Uh, other ones would be sudden movements where we orient like this. Uh, Classic one might be you're driving in your motor car, you've got a passenger next to you and you have to suddenly brake and your arm shoots out in front of you or in front of your passenger. When in fact in a, an emergency braking situation, both hands should be on the wheel. So if for instance, you've learned to drive in a fairly low powered car and you suddenly come into some money or someone gives you a, a Porsche 930 turbo, we've gone from 125 horsepower to 730 horsepower, and if you buy that Porsche, you may, be, you may well be given several lessons with an advanced driving school to stop the way you've been driving your little Kia or whatever it might be and how to learn to properly drive a really powerful car with different dynamics. You've got to give up a lot of old learning. Okay, so um, these are evolutionary primed fears. The pr most prominent ones is, is, is drowning, being without oxygen, because three minutes without oxygen, you're in real trouble. So we have all sorts of mechanisms to avoid going into those places. And of course, it makes a lot of sense that rather than having to be in one of those places, you can actually learn to avoid being in one of those places or at least get out of there quickly. Okay, so this is kind of the four methods of learning. Let me go over them really quickly, then we'll move on. So instrumental learning, where you are the one who makes trial and error methods. Let's see what works, what doesn't work. Uh, two, vicarious learning, watching what happens to other people. Three, learning by authority. This is how we do things around here. Don't rock the boat. Just pay attention and learn how we do things here. And then fourth is evolutionary primed. You don't get a second chance. And so it's often accompanied by yucky sensations to really reinforce. Don't do it the other way. Don't even think, just do it this way and you'll survive. These are split second decisions you've got to make. And if you don't make them, you get the Darwin Award and your, <laughs> your genes do not get passed on. So let's go back to where we were. How is it that the more often I'm flying, the worse I'm getting? And that's what I want to answer in the next couple of minutes. So to answer that question, have a look at this series of lines and dots and things on the screen at the moment. You can enlarge the screen. In a moment, I'm going to put a red box starting from the top left-hand side and then move it around. And what I'd like you to see is how quickly your eye goes to the one element in the box that isn't the same as the others. So if you're ready, here we go. Here's the first red box and the second and the third and the fourth. And I want you to notice how quickly your eye goes to the one element that is not the same as the others. Even before you can name it, even before you can write it down, even before you've got a word for it, your eye is going there and seeing it. These all these things all have different orientations or lengths or shapes or colors. And yes, there's even the detection of motion. We have in our bodies, in our brains, in our eyes, various ways to detect changes, novelty. The same part of your brain that detects threat is also partly responsible for detecting novelty. Do I know what this is? And you can see how quick you are. Let me show you another video uh, where things go the other way around. Have a look at this woman. She's giving at a university campus some instructions to a worker about how to get to some place on campus. And then looks what, look what happens. As it turns out, about 50% of people don't notice the change. That is, it wasn't the same worker. 
So what these two little diagrams illustrate are some important concepts that are needed to answer this question of how come I'm getting worse. In the first one with all the dots and the lines, whatever else, it shows you how quickly you can attend to difference and change. You just orient quite quickly to it, even before you have language to describe, because the boxes were moving quite swiftly. And in fact, the, the more swiftly it moves, you still can do it quite quickly without needing language. In the second one, with the woman giving the instructions, this is a situation which is the reverse. It's called change blindness, which is where about half the people uh, also watching this video don't see the change. The change being the worker has changed. Uh, when that door goes in front, the worker changes, which you saw. Go back, as I said, and have another look at it. This is called inattentional change blindness. It's very important for complex activity in surgery, in planes, uh, where you may not notice small things start to happen. So we've got these two components here, change blindness and also hypersensitivity to certain things. So how does this work to answer our question of being on board a plane. Here's something interesting. Uh, you may have noticed, those of you who are looking closely, that I've actually changed shirts since you saw before. And that's because it's about two weeks later that I'm recording this and I decided to have a little change of shirt, but it looks quite similar. Those of you who may have seen it straight away, it may be an accident or it may be because you noticed my previous shirt and said, oh, I've got one like that. And, uh, and so when I come back with this one, having noticed the shirt, you may not have seen it. You may have seen a new shirt. Oh, but most of you won't because it's the same sort of dark bluish kind of thing. Uh, the other thing is I'm not wearing my lanyard right now. Here's my point. This is where things get interesting. We are constantly learning. We're constantly making inferences. We're constantly noticing differences and sameness and making comparisons always under the hood. So when you're on a plane and you're flying quite nicely and you go through a really difficult thunderstorm, turbulence, go round, wherever it might be, your brain has to put that information somewhere. And if you say to yourself, wow, that was really scary, your brain isn't just going to kind of forget about that. It's going to link up being scared to a plane and to flying and certain conditions. So it may be that the next time you fly, rather than needing all sorts of really strong turbulence, a five out of five flight attendants take your seat, it may only be a three to get the same kind of sensory <gasps> upsetness because your brain has learnt. But it doesn't need as much of a strong set of stimuli to get the same quality and quantity of reaction. A couple more flights, it may now only need the, the captain or the first officer to go, bing, seatbelts please. The plane is perfectly still flying along, quite, quite stable, and you're already starting to get the, the very strong sensations because your brain has learned to be ready for this. But then it keeps on learning so that as you board the flight, what happens if? And then as the weeks go by, it may just be the thought that I'm going to go on board a plane. <gasps> Bring, your body has learnt. In other words, the rules that you've been conducting life by, the more often you practice something, the better you get it, has not changed. What's happening is with more practice, i.e. with more flying, your brain is becoming better and better at being switched on to alarms and threats, but to lesser and lesser stimuli and more later, more quickness, more speedily. And because we've got language, we don't actually need to be inside the cabin. We can just think about having a flight even months in advance and have here and now strong reactions. It's not a body that is breaking down and there's something really wrong here. In fact, it's a signal that our ability to detect threat early has probably saved us over the course of, of human evolution from going to dangerous situations with a philosophy that says better safe than sorry. So no, it's not the case that something's really wrong, that the laws of learning have been inverted, that the more often you do something, the worse you get it, you're getting better at something, and that's switching on the threat response systems more quickly to lesser stimuli. Your radar detection has actually become 
even more sensitive. The trouble is it's switching on to things that don't require that threat response because in fact, logically speaking, it's actually quite safe in there. But once you start to have these signals, your brain says, well, my goodness me, if I'm having these strong signals, by definition, I'm in danger. And that's not quite how it works. So I hope this answers that question. It doesn't answer, what am I supposed to do about this? What happens if I've been learning that way? How do I unlearn and undo this stuff? And that's where we're going to go into my next video. So I hope this helps. It's perfectly okay that the more I'm flying, the worse I'm getting. It's because inadvertently under the hood, you're practicing getting better at switching on the threat signals earlier and earlier without thought, just like all those different lines and dots and colors you recognize without language. That's kind of what's going on. You're switching on your sensory apparatus to things. Okay, so in the future episode, we're gonna try and teach you how to undo that stuff. It's perfectly eminently doable. That's the most important thing. Come back for that one soon. Bye for now.